Well, good morning. If you have your Bible, oh, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1. We're starting a brand new series this morning called Joyful. We're going to talk about the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter called Philippians. And the context of this letter, which I'm going to set up in just a minute, the context of this letter is going to set up this entire series that we're going through, which is about how to be joyful no matter what happens in life. So go to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be in uh, verses 1 through 11 today. Um, I'm going to read it. If you don't have your mind, it'll be up on the speed for you as well. But here's what Paul says. This is the Apostle Paul. He wrote over half the New Testament. Tons of good wisdom. And here's what he says. He said, this is Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. To all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being in confidence of this, that he who began here, a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and to the praise of God. When you hit a crisis in life, who do you turn to? Back in 2019, I believe it was, I'm not at liberty to share any details this morning, so I'm not going to get very detailed. I would hit a major crisis in my work, and in my life. I was hit with some news in a moment that changed my work schedule, how our ministry functioned. It changed my life schedule because I had been gone from my family for extra hours, extra evenings to try to figure out how to handle the situation. But I might even know how I handled it. One of the first steps that I took was I called a man, one of my great mentors in life. His name is Matt Swigger. I have a picture of it him up on the screen that'll be up on there there you go matt is on the right with the wolf back baseball will they both oh but he's in the art for sure matt is a man who has been my ministry mentor for many years for the last seven years and he's also been a great friend i call him every once a month on thursday every single month and we talk through life struggles if i'm in a struggle and if i struggle with some sort of sins or if i just need some advice as matt is one of the best dads that i know when my second daughter was about to be born back in March, I have a five, almost five-year-old daughter and now an uh, almost one-year-old daughter. When she was about to be born, though, a week before we went into the hospital, I had, this, I had this, this inclination in my heart that I want to be not just a good dad, I want to be the best possible dad that I can be. However, I don't have a medal and I have two little girls. Now, if you're a dad in the room and you have all girls in your family, you probably share this struggle at some point. You said, I want to be the best dad I can possibly be, but I have no idea how to do that with little girls. I know I'm going to get down on the floor of like Barbies, which I, I love to do. I take my daughters and they look pretty frequently, and that's fun. But what in the world? How am I supposed to decide my daughter? How am I supposed to be? You know, I have this intimate father daughter relationship where she can come to me with anything. I want to nap that. But I had to learn this male, female, father, daughter, dynamic. That's, it's easy with boys. When boys are struggling, just tap below. Right? That's easy. And so Matt was my phone call because Matt has some daughters. And he gave me some of the best advice that I've ever heard when it came to, to being a dad to a little girl. Matt is my guy that I call. And the question I have for you is who do you call when a crisis hits? When life hits the fan, who is that person in your life? And I want to, this is for everybody, but I also want to speak to the men for a moment. Men, this is absolutely crucial for you to have in your life. Here's why. In the modern man, we have it sort of ingrained into what it means to be a man, what it means to be a true masculine man. What does that mean? 
You have to work hard, and if you can't, if somebody else can't get the job done right, you need to do it yourself. And there's a lot of, I need to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I need to go from life and figure out myself and nobody else can help me, nobody else should help me. But I'm a man, so I should be able to do it myself. Now, there is good in independence. But what this is ingrained into our man culture, manly culture, her culture around masculinity, is isolation. In fact, one of the biggest struggles that men face today, especially in America, is loneliness. Loneliness and isolation. In fact, studies have shown that for every one woman who commits suicide, three men have committed suicide. And one of the leading factors in that decision is loneliness and isolation. And so I want to ask you again, this is crucially serious, who is it in your life that you can call regularly when self is the fan? Now, this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is modeling for us. Because the context of Philippians, as he's talking about how, how thankful he is for this church in Philippi, Paul is in a dark, cold prison cell in the city of Rome. Now, I'm not talking about a fancy first world prison cell. Not that our modern day prisons are that fancy, but you get three meals a day, there's rules and there's regulations. I'm talking about this is a first century prison. In the middle of Rome, he probably gets maybe a piece of bread a day. It's dark, it's damp, it's cold. And he's in chains. Why is he in chains? Why is he in prison? He's been preaching the gospel. Now, what's funny about the context, well, not necessarily what's funny, because prison isn't funny, but what's sort of ironic about the context of the story is that Paul, for a long time, has been longing to get to Rome. If you, if you read Paul's letter to the, to the Romans, the book of Romans in the New Testament, he talks to them and he says, I have a longing to get to Rome to see you so I can visit you, so I can meet with the government, so I can preach the gospel in your city. I have a longing to do this, but it just doesn't work out. Now, what's funny about the story is that Paul ends up in Rome. And how Paul gets there isn't because it's convenient and he had time, he had money to get there. He got arrested in a different city for preaching the gospel because Christians were persecuted at this time. He was arrested, put on a boat, and sailed off to Rome. And so Paul's desire, Paul's bucket list is fulfilled. Now, there's a cheap message in this part of the story. It might not be how Paul wanted to get there, but isn't that how God works sometimes? We might, we might not necessarily be exactly where we want to be in life. We might, not be, we, might, we might not get there in exactly the way that we want to get there in love. But God's plan is sometimes not our plan. God's plan is sometimes not our idea. In fact, where you are today, whether you work in a certain place or you have a certain family, you live in a certain city, you live on a certain block, wherever you're at today is exactly where God has you. And how you got there may not be how you envisioned getting there, but this is exactly where God wants you to be. Now, what gets interesting about this is Paul writes this letter and he's sounding very joyful, sounding very thankful, He's writing to the Philippians, and he says, To all of God's people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Now, this is the part of this, the letter that totally baffles me. Because can you imagine how life-changing it would be to be sitting in a dark, cold prison cell and how scary that would be i mean the vast majority of us would probably be filled with fear and anxiety and so much questions about what is going to happen in the future and when i make the difference between a modern prison and the prison that paul is sitting in most people don't get out of prison in false situation it usually always leads to death and so Paul knows that what's coming might not be good. What's coming might not be his release, but it might be his death. But in that, he says, in all my prayers for you, the church of Philippi, in all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. Now the question that I have coming out of this is, how in the world can you and I be like Paul? Because when life gets hard in my life, the first thing I, that I think about is not joy. The first emotion that comes to my mind is not like, oh, that's okay. I'll just smile through it in cloud. 
No, 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 when hard things come in my head, I get fearful, I get anxious, I get frustrated, I get angry. So many emotions can come to the surface, but here's what I want to do. I want to separate joy from happiness. Because so much of our lives today, I think, is all about seeking happiness. If we could just be happy, no matter what happens, if we could just be happy, we'd be okay. But what Paul is teaching us here is that life is going to throw you curveballs. And that life is going to throw you curveballs and pain is going to come your way. The goal isn't to try to just be happy all the time through it. The goal is to find joy. And so here's where I like to say about joy and happiness. Happiness usually is connected to happenstance. If you're going to be happy, it's going to be direct and tied to the circumstances around. But joy is different. Joy is connected to your confidence in your Savior. Joy is connected to your confidence in your Father God, who is always in control. Happiness is an emotion that will come and go by the circumstances that happen to you, but joy is an inward posture of dependence that can never change, because our God doesn't change. So you can be in the prison, or you can be in the hospital room watching your baby boy or your baby girl being born, and what you could have in both situations because God is good and he trusts God in all things and he doesn't change, what you can have in both of those moments is the joy of the Lord. And what I'm talking about is not that you're going to walk around happy because you're in prison. What I'm talking about is you have this humble confidence that God will never change. He's always in control. And because of that, you can be self-controlled and filled with joy. This is the great life lesson that Paul is teaching us, that no matter what happens, whether we get sick or we're healthy, whether we're at a wedding or we're at a funeral, we can always have joy. But the big question is, where does this come from? Where does our joy come from? I love the way that author Amelia Barr described joy in the face of sorrow. She said, it is only in sorrow that bad weather maxers us, but in joy, we face the storm and defiant. I want to know what she you. How can we face a storm in life and keep our joy so that we can defy the storm, so we can get through the storm? And what we see in Paul is that his joy does not come from his circumstance. His joy has a source. Now, through this letter, I often have a hard time reading the first chapter of Philippians because as a man, when I read things like, in all my prayers, I always have joy. And at, in all the times that I think of you, I always am so thankful for you. I read this like, it's a little affectionate for my taste, honestly. <laughs> but what Paul is writing about here is a true friendship. It's a true connection to these people in this church. I was at a meeting two weeks ago for our denomination, and we were meeting with the new president of Converge. That's our denomination, and he's been our president for the last couple of months. And I sit down at this table, and we're in a, a big back room in a restaurant downtown. And I don't even know who he is, which was kind of funny. I felt like this guy was like, why am I even here? How did I get invited to this meeting? But I'm sitting down, and I'm one of the first people there. I sit down, and this guy says, snitch to me, and I introduce myself. I'm like, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? And I said, what's your name? He's like, oh, my name's John. He's like, John Jenkins? Yeah. <laughs> You're the president. Okay. Hi. How are you? Who are you? Oh, my goodness. I don't even know where you are. I don't even know what you look like, but good to meet you. And then another pastor sits next to me, and he's an older pastor. His name was Joel Johnson. He's a pastor down to South of the city. I've never met him before. He just that's me. We... We exchange names, all that kind of stuff. And the first thing he says to me is, Do you have a soul friend? I'm like, What? Do you have a soul friend? I'm like, Well, if you could define a soul friend for me, I could tell you if I have one. <laughs> That's out of it. And a soul friend, according to him, is just like Matt Swider to my life, what I was explaining to you earlier. A soul friend is no matter what's happening in your life, you can call that person. This is the person that knows how your soul is actually doing. This is the person that you don't walk by in the church lobby, even on your worst day, you say, good morning, how are you? Good, I'm good, how are you? Good, okay, then you walk, you walk in. 
This is a person where you can tell the deepest sins of your life, the deepest struggles of your life, and the greatest joys of your life as well. And so we got talking about what a soul friend is. I was, I was explaining some of my, my friendships that I have and people that I can confide in in that way. And he said, you're 29, 29 years old and you're a yearly pastor. But if I can tell you one thing that will get you through your next 30 years of ministry or wherever God has it, whether it's ministry or not, if I could tell you one thing, it's get a soul friend. And as I'm reading the first chapter of Philippians through this verse, I'm thinking, this guy knows what Paul knows. The source of our joy comes from the people that God sends us. The source of our joy, no matter what we're going through in life, is do we have people around us who share the same faith that we do? Who are going to pray with us? Who are going to talk with us? That even if we're the problem or if something's just happening to us, they're going to walk us through what we're going through. See, oftentimes as men, we think that we need to go through life alone, but that's the easiest trap to put yourself in. And if you think that you could just walk through every single problem by yourself and isolate yourself, and it's all about you, and you're going to be tough, tough, you're going to be strong, and you're going to get through this, I believe that is one of Satan's deceptive ways where he can cause men to fall and women to fall. And so what is the source of Paul's joy? It is the deep and it's the intimate connections and the friendships that he has in the gospel. Paul says, I thank my God every time I think of you, think of you in our partnership in the gospel. And what Paul is referring to in this moment is that most of us have friends. Most of us have this at least surface level friends where we can, we can talk about the Vikings and the Packers. We can exchange pleasantries. We can do this and we can do that. But we have to have a greater source of friendship. And this greater source of friendship is found in the gospel. There's an old phrase that I love to hear. It's, it's blood is thicker than water. Have you guys heard that phrase before? Blood is thicker than water. Now, there's a lot of questions about what's the origin of this phrase. And I was doing some research, and there wasn't a lot there. The, the most prominent one was back in the 1200s in Germany. Some tribes and some uh, different groups were coming together, and that's how they joined. That's how they committed to one another. But with my research of finding this phrase, I found the full phrase. Because oftentimes over centuries, words get lost and translations get lost. Here's the full phrase. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. And what's fascinating about this is I have no idea if this has Christian roots or not. No idea if the people, whether it was the people in Germany who came up with it, if they were Christians or not. But this full quote is exactly what Paul is talking about. See, our unity in our friendships, our soul friends that we have in Christ, how, where does our unity come from? How do we get this sort of unity within the body of Christ? How do we have a person like Paul who is so, he's, he's in a terrible situation, yet he's so overcome with joy because he has these people. Where does this intimate friendship come from? It's the blood of Jesus. See, when Jesus died for us on the cross, his blood was poured out for us. And that is the sign and the symbol of the new covenant that was instituted by God. See, in the Old Testament, you had the priests of the Jewish people who would have to go to the altar and then have to sacrifice animals. And the blood that would spill out of the animals would be the symbol and the sign of the Old Covenant. And that Old Covenant means... Every single time you sin, once a week, you got to go to the altar, you got to sacrifice an animal. That would atone for the sins of that week. Now, in the New Covenant, we have Jesus who took the place of the lamb. This is why I call Jesus the lamb. He took the place of the sheep, goes to the cross, and spills out his blood for you and I, instituting the New Covenant. And that New Covenant says that we don't have to go back every single week to the altar to sacrifice an animal. We don't have to go back because our sins are no longer atoned for because we just keep on sinning. The new covenant is that every single time now that we sin going forward, 
grace and forgiveness washes over us and wipes us clean because Jesus has poured out his blood for you. This is the unifying mark of all believers. That we all believe in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. The blood that Jesus spilled up for us is what unifies the church here at Isani, the church in deep in the Amazon jungle, the church in Kenya, the church in North Korea, everywhere around the world, period, unified by our Savior Jesus who died for us. And when our source of joy comes from those unified friendships and a relationship with Jesus, then our joy can never be taken from us. Because those people and these relationships and Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, none of this can be taken from us. And this is where God is never changing. See, oftentimes we try to put so much of our own joy and our own happiness in our own strength. But what the Bible teaches us in Philippians 4.13 is we can do all things through who gives us strength through Christ. See, modern psychology will tell you that you can do it. The modern psychological secular version of Philippians 4.13 is I can do all things through myself who gives me strength. And I would venture to believe, because I've done this myself, I would venture to believe that the vast majority of majority of us, maybe every single person in this room has tried that strategy before. That if you can do all things through Christ who, through yourself, who gives you strength. I'll be honest with you, that is pretty much me every single day. As someone who immensely struggles with pride and thinking that I can get through all my problems, I don't need anybody's help. As someone who struggles with that, this is one of the number one sins that I struggle with. And I have to constantly remind myself, I need God because I'm the one who's messed it up. I can't do things through myself who gives me strength because I'm the one who is not perfect. I'm the one who keeps sinning. I'm the one who keeps falling. I'm the one who keeps making mistakes. I need a source outside of myself to give me strength to walk through the dire circumstances of love. And that source is Christ. But here's what we often do with this type of message. Is when we hear Philippians 4.13, we say, I can do all things to Christ who gives me strength. We think it's only me and God. I have heard this so many times from not only people in our church, but people all around that I've met along my, my way in life. I've heard so many times, I don't need people, it's just me and God. Just me, my dog, and God. And my gloves. I did now, I want to encourage you. You need to have that relationship with God. I would never preach against that. But what we often don't understand is that God is the one who is working through other people and he's sending people in our lives. If you just commit to just you and God, you're going to find yourself isolated and lonely and strong. Because if God is trying to put other people in your life so that he can speak to them and through them to help you find joy in all things and strength in all circumstances, and you're pushing those people away and saying, nope, I'm just going to do me, it's just me and God. You are pushing out the work and the voice of God in your life. Our joy is directly tied to the death and resurrection of Jesus, but also directly tied to the people that we have around us to pray for us and to encourage us and to be with us in all things. And our joy is in other people. And that's a scary thought because we're all imperfect, but our joy is in other people because the blood of the covenant is thicker than lock. We are a family of believers. We are not just individuals who come to worship on Sunday morning, but we are connected in an intimate spiritual relationship with one another. And not just here in that city, but all around the world. Some of the most powerful moments of ministry and relationship that I've ever had in my personal life have been times where we've gone on mission trips to Mexico, and I've been able to meet with local pastors, and that connection that we have, even though we can barely understand each other, that connection, that relationship is so strong. Why? Because our faith is what connects us, and our faith is far greater than us. 
we are connected to something bigger than ourselves. We need one another. And what I find so fascinating in Paul's letter is how he responds to the people of Philippi. He is, he's so much, he's, he's so intimately connected with these people that even in the midst of his terrible situation in prison, this is what he says. He prays for them. He says, this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So that you may be you may be aiding to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Paul is so overcome with Jesus, and he is dying to himself so greatly that even in the midst of being in prison. He's praying and thinking for the other people. I find this shocking. If I was in prison, my first phone call would be to my wife, and I'd be telling her, I need help, please, and it would all become about me. Help me, I need help. Pray for me, think about me. And yet, what is Paul's expression? It's not anywhere, it's outward. And what does he pray for? He prays that they would grow in their knowledge and depth of insight of God. That they would continue to grow in their faith. And why? So that they can discern, they can grow in discernment as the world keeps getting more and more anti-biblical. As the world keeps getting crazier and more sinful and turning further away from God, Paul's prayer for them is that they would grow in their knowledge of God and that they would grow in their discernment. Discernment is the ability to use wisdom. A practical version of discernment would be, you know, an unpastor so study with people pretty regularly. If I'm meeting with somebody who I know struggles with alcohol, I'm not going to call up and say, hey, let's go to winter greens. I know you don't drink, but I can use a beer. That's not discernment. Discernment is how to practically apply wisdom to life. And this is what Paul is praying over the Philippian people. That no matter what the what way the world goes, no matter how ugly, no matter how sinful, no matter how anti-God the world gets, he's praying that they would grow in their knowledge and their discernment so that they would know how to battle and how to fight against the ways of the world. And what I love about this prayer is that Paul says, he, he doesn't say, shelter yourself. He says, use wisdom. Because as believers... We are never called to turn away from the world. We're called to live in the world, but not of it. No matter how dark, how sinful, how any time God our world becomes, our job as believers is to never turn inward. It's to always still stay in that dark place. Continue to live in this dark world. Why? Because we are the lights of the world. Because we have the light of the world. And this is Paul's prayer. And the great lesson that I think that we can learn in the midst of this is that no matter what happens to us, our life is always meant to be lived for God and for others. And so I want to close with that question. Who do you have in your life that you can call when life hits the fan? Who do you have in your life that is a soul friend? And I'm not just talking about somebody that you could watch the Vikings hang. That's great. I have a lot of friends like that. I'm not just talking about the surface, surface level relationships that we have, whether it's in church or at work or in our neighborhood. And I'm not talking about the friendships that you have with non-Christian people. I hope that you have deep and good friendships with non-Christian people. If you don't, you need some and you need more. Because that shows you that you're being a missionary in your work. But this soul friend, this person that, just like Paul, that you need to be connected with, or the small group of people that you need to be connected with, these are believers. And why does it have to be a believer? Why can't it just be a guy that we went to high school with? Because what unifies us? It's the blood of Christ. It's somebody that shares the same thing with you. 
Because when you're going through a situation and you need prayer, and the first person that you go to, it's good to talk to people, but when it's the first person that you go to, you know they're not going to respond by, I'll pray for you, let's pray right now. If you know they're not going to pray for you, then that's not the person. You need somebody in your life who is praying for you, who is ready to call you out when you're, when you're the one in the wrong. You need somebody in your life that is a soul friend that you can go to any time in your greatest highs or your lowest thoughts. For Paul, this is the people in Philippi. This is the believers in this church. The big question I have for you is who is it for you?